Placental drug transfer is a major source of confusion for a lot of people, so we're going to try and clear that up today. So we start out with um, giving a drug to someone. So let's say this is their very unattractive hand, and we're going to um, inject a certain amount of drug with our lovely syringe here, and we're going to inject a certain dose. And that drug's going to go in their hand and up and eventually reach the heart where it's going to mix with the rest of the blood. And so other important features in here would be the volume of distribution of that drug, which would then determine the concentration in the blood. Some of that drug is also going to become protein bound, which will become later, which will become important later. So it leaves the heart of the mother, and the amount and rate that it leaves would be dependent on the maternal cardiac output. And somewhere along the way, much of that blood, in fact 12% of it, is going to head out toward the uterus. So we're talking about uterine blood flow. Uterine blood flow then depends on the arterial pressure driving it toward the uterus minus the venous pressure causing it to back up and divided by uterine vascular resistance. So contractions, drugs, um, aortic cable compression, these things will affect this. And so from here it goes on into our very beautiful uterus here. And in the uterus, we're going to have a placenta. And on this side is the fetal side. Here's our little fetus here. So when the drug reaches the placenta, remember it's still protein bound. still some protein binding of that drug and some of it actually gets bound to placental tissue but it's not a, a large amount and then there's a certain amount of drug that's free and remember that it's the free drug that actually has the opportunity to cross the placenta and get into the baby so what is it that determines whether a drug can get across this barrier well a few things about the drug first of all um, one is its size, so if it's huge, it has more difficulty getting across. Another is its charge, highly charged products don't get across very easily. And finally, whether or not it's lipophilic. Lipophilic drugs get across much easier than hydrophilic drugs. So again, the free fraction is what's going to approach the barrier. And then the next important thing is the barrier itself. So for the barrier, we're interested in how thick it is, and also its surface area. When you have more room to, to cross, there's, you're more likely to get across than if it's a very small placental barrier, for instance, an abruption, something like that. So then it crosses to the fetal side, and so now the fetus is going to have an amount of free drug and it has its own protein that's going to bind some of that drug. From here, the drug goes out through the umbilical vein back toward the baby. And here's our baby. And he's got a little tiny heart here. So this blood is going to come in and head toward the heart. Now some of it is actually going to go right by the baby's liver and have an opportunity to get metabolized there. Baby's livers do function. Another part of it is going to go around the liver, reach the heart, and then get out to the circulation, including affecting the baby's brain if it's a drug that has effects there. And finally, it's going to go by the baby's kidney, and some of it will get excreted 
into the amniotic fluid where it can get reabsorbed into the umbilical cord or get um, absorbed. The baby can drink it and have metabolism through the liver that way. And the rest of it that stays in the bloodstream eventually comes back out the umbilicus in the umbilical artery and goes back to the placenta. And so that's going to have a slightly different concentration of drug in it. Obviously, this free flow here. And at some point, when the maternal drug gets low enough, this actually can go this way instead of, instead of the other direction. Meanwhile, the maternal, as it returns to mom, the drug returns to mom, it proceeds on past her kidneys and her liver, and from there there's metabolism and excretion of these products. So the total amount of drug that a baby receives is going to be dependent on how much mom gets. So think of it in terms of extremes. If you don't give mom any drug, the baby will have no drug. It also depends on what the concentration in her bloodstream is, which depends on the volume of distribution, which remember in pregnancy there's an increase in plasma volume and a decrease in protein concentration from dilution and so that's going to affect some drugs. Um, protein binding in mom. Mom's got to have a cardiac output for the drug to get there at all. There has to be uterine blood flow, so if mom's severely hypotensive, if she's got a uterine tetany, you're going to have much less drug transfer. Once it gets to the placenta, then you're depending on the barrier function of the placenta and also the qualities of the drug itself. When it does get to the baby, there's still an opportunity for the baby to metabolize this drug before it affects the brain. And then once it gets back to mom, back to the placenta, then there's transfer back to mom and back out of the system where mom can then metabolize the drug. For completeness, there's a few other things about drug transfer that we'll add down here at the bottom. What was just described was passive transport, the one that's dependent on so much about the drug itself. Um, in addition to passive transport, drugs can get across using facilitated transport, and that differs a bit from passive transport in that you actually have to have a channel or a carrier. So it's carrier mediated. It still has to go down a concentration gradient because this is still not energy requiring. And it's saturable, saturatable because it's a channel. Then you can also have inhibition when there's a, a channel that it's going through and um, it happens to be temperature dependent. So as the temperature rises, there's additional transfer. Um, an example would be glucose and also um, the co-transport of um, amino acids is through facilitated transport. Um, the next one that needs to be mentioned is active transport. And by active, you can imagine that it means requires energy. And so with active transport, it's still carrier mediated, it's still saturable, it can still be inhibited, it's not as temperature dependent, um, but more importantly the biggest thing about it is is this um, requires energy. So usually from a sodium potassium ATPase. Um, and then finally, the last one we need to mention is called penocytosis. And if you, it's, um, it's important for larger molecules that still get across. For instance, um, IgG. So if we have a little IgG here, 
it's really big and so what happens is the membrane itself is coming around and it actually sort of invaginates to bring in the IgG and eventually this then closes and the IgG is now inside the membrane dissolves and that's how it gets that in. So penocytosis is only important for a very small number of things. Active transports, obviously very important, facilitated transport, but the main one that you need to understand is passive transport, and that's what we went up, uh, talked about above. So I hope this helps to clear up some of these issues about placental transfer.